This is Professor Resnick again. What I'd like to do is uh, present you a, uh, a summary um, of what we've done in the course. And um, I'm going to do that in terms of telling you a story about the uh, U.S. economy over the last, oh, let's say, four decades, roughly from the middle 1970s up until uh, the, the present. So I want to kind of review the course, exploitation, the business cycle, and so forth, contradictions, overdetermination, um, uh, through this story that I'm going to tell you about capitalism in the United States. Okay. Let me start out. We start out in the 1970s um, with a more or less uh, regulated capitalism. Um, I'm going to use the term uh, uh, that's popular now. It wasn't that wasn't the term of the day? Um, in the 1970s, we still had, in many ways, the heritage of the 1930s in the United States, in which the state played a very important role in the economy. And what the state did um, was uh, intervene in a variety of different ways to maintain capitalism, to regulate it. Um, that was partly the lesson of the 1930s um, in which under F uh, FDR, Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the state intervened in order to try and get us out of that uh, business cycle. It didn't succeed. It took World War II to do that, but the st there were major changes which occurred um, at that moment in time um, that the state would play an active role in trying to offset um, the, the depression that was uh, occurring in the United States. and it was threatening uh, the survival of the United States. Secondly, the state played a very, very obviously key role in World War II. The third is, is that a new notion arose in the United States in which people looked more to the state, in part because of what it did in the 1930s, and in part because of this kind of collective um, action during the war, that the state had a role in providing, um, and let me again use a term popular today, a safety net for, for, for the society. And in so doing, the, the, the state would be kind of an employer of last resort, um, would regulate various key markets, including the labor market, and so forth. So the, the people understood, and people accepted and wanted the state to have this kind of uh, role in society. And Congress reflected that, um, and as did the various presidents, uh, both Republican and Democrat. In the 19th, okay, so we got an economy in which um, the state is playing a major role. And by the way, it's also reflected in economics, um, Keynesian theory, um, which is a, a theory that explains the, why the state should play this role. Keynesian theory was more or less hegemonic, and neoclassical economic theory had been demoted. So macro theory was, was a, a key um, uh, understanding um, in, in uh, economics uh, profession uh, around the land, and that's what was taught um, in most universities. It wasn't just as if micro theory wasn't taught, it was taught, um, but the macro theory and the Keynesian theory um, had a dominant place. The 1970s also starts, or the, excuse me, the 1970s is also characterized by the following problem, a major problem. And I'm going to put the problem on the blackboard. The surplus value in American industry was less than the demands on that surplus. So look what we've done here. We, we've gone right to the Marxian entry point where I began this course. And we're saying, OK, let's make sense of this problem in the United States from a Marxian perspective, which is that the surplus that was being pumped out of the workers was less than the demands on it. Basically, in non-Marxian terms, people understood the mid-1970s, late-1970s as, as, as a severe crisis in American society. It looked as if American capitalism was nearing its, its end. Um, and people were worried, deeply worried, that our investments in plant and equipment and so forth was falling, our productivity was falling, where we weren't able to compete in a variety of different industries with our competitors, the Japanese, the Europeans, the Brazilians, and the Koreans, and so forth. There was a real problem. We were losing our edge in a variety of different industries in which we had a, 
uh, superior position after World War II, um, it was a problem. Okay? In Marxian terms, the problem is such. Okay? And I want to now look at the first the right-hand side and the left-hand side to explain exactly what this problem was in these value terms. So on the right-hand side, one, the subsumed class payment to workers via the workers' unions was very large. So maybe I should just add it over here. Helping this inequality on the right-hand side were these payments that the capitalists had to make to the workers. So what this was all about was that the price of labor power was greater than its unit value in industry after industry after industry. And you, you can ask, OK, why? Well, in many ways, this was the heritage of what happened in the 1930s, the presidency of Franklin Delano Roosevelt the, the, and the various presidents thereafter. It, it, was a, it was a period of time in which unions were, were looked upon favorably. They were strengthened under federal law. There was a culture which was supportive of unions. And all that helped the AFL and CIO in the United States to assume a strong bargaining position in a variety of leading industries, automobile industry, rubber industry, elect electric industry, and so forth, etc., transportation industry, in which those strong unions were able to get a price, a wage for their workers higher than the unit value. And that was supported by the federal government. Okay? So this is bad news for the capitalists. The bad news is this inequality. This is part of the crisis. Okay? The bad news, you had to pay these workers more than what they're worth in value terms. And that puts a strain on the surplus. But that wasn't the end of it. By the way, let me be consistent. That's bad news okay, for the capitalists. Is there any good news? Yes, there is good news. The good news uh, from this uh, 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 extra payment to the workers because of the union power was that the workers had, obviously, higher wages okay, via their unions. And so then the workers could take their higher wages and go out and buy all kinds of uh, consumer goods, which helped the capitalists realize their surplus. So the workers, monopoly position on the selling of labor power, earn them higher incomes. That's a disaster to the capitalists. That's the blackboard. But then the, the contradiction is there's a good side to the capitalists, which allows the capitalists to realize their surplus, because now they can sell the cars and the boats and the homes and, and, and so forth to all the, the, the workers. So it, it's contra always contradictory. You know, for, for example, um, if they can drive this home, um, the unions were very strong in certain uh, uh, cities in the Northeast that were producing, Pittsburgh, for example, uh, that were producing all kinds of, uh, you know, uh, uh, producing all kinds of steel um, in that particular uh, very famous uh, town. So the workers there had a higher, via the steel workers union, had a higher price of their labor power. That gave them higher incomes. That higher incomes, in turn, allowed those workers to have something which they hadn't had before, to buy a small house in the suburbs, buy a small house, to buy a car, to commute from the suburb to work and then back, to outfit the house with all kinds of consumer goods, including a little boat that you would put in the, uh, back in the uh, uh, driveway, which you would use on the weekends and also to purchase something which became very valuable and reflected this, which is tickets to the National Football League, which is a multi-billion dollar industry in the United States, which grew rapidly after you know, World War II. Okay. So the bad news is this, but then there's the good news for the workers and the capitalists. Okay. Next, there was another demand on the surplus, which was very large, which was in the form of corporate taxes. Okay, So the second one was the subsumed class payment that had to be paid by the capitalists to the federal government in the form of corporate taxes. Okay. 
So what that meant was that the capitalists had to take a significant share of their gross profits, the surplus, and pay them to the federal government. How high? If I remember correctly, I think the tax was 0.52. So more than half of the surplus had to be given in terms of a tax payment to the state. That was a disaster. Okay? So not only did you have strong unions, but you had a strong state putting demands on this surplus. So that's, that, that's bad news for the capitalists. Any good news? Yes, there too it's contradictory. Because it is true that the state took a hefty cut of the surplus, but then the state provided an environment in which the capitalists could produce and sell their goods, not just nationally, but, but globally. That is, if you think about what is the state providing the capitalists, well, the state is providing the capitalists, which is good news for the capitalists, is an enormous defense expenditures after the war to fight the Cold War. Okay? And so that means that the capitalists are producing and selling commodities to the state. It's kind of a guaranteed contract that the state is providing <coughs> by saying to the capitalists, look, you produce the tanks, the weapons, and you, the, the tanks, the airplanes, and so forth, etc. We buy, okay? And therefore, the capitalist has less risk than would otherwise because you're kind of a guaranteed market by selling to the state. And then the capitalist can produce these commodities and realize their sale to the state. So that's a great benefit to the capitalist. But of course, the capitalists are paying a tax on that, number one. Number two. This, the, the, US, the federal government, the U.S. government, provides a kind of, uh, oh, I don't know what to, what to call it, kind of a protective network around the world, enabling the capitalists to sell their goods, not just in the states, but every place, because the United States becomes increasingly a hegemonic power after World War II. And so the defense expenditures are not just for a defensive army, but they're for bases around the world, which helps our exports around the world. Third. The state is providing all kinds of new research and development, which helps capitalists. You know, everything from uh, computers and chip, uh, computer chips and polio vaccine, jet airplanes, it's just, it's endless. The state is funding research and development in a variety of universities uh, around the United States and, and other places as well. And some, out of some of that research comes all these new products, which enable the capitalists to produce new use values embodying surplus value. So, to make a long story short, sure, there are costs, but there are benefits as, as well. Third, a new subsumed class payment emerges towards the end of the 1970s, which is OPEC. Okay. What happens now is that the oil, the oil producing uh, uh, state companies Organized, they get together, as I think I mentioned to you, in Geneva. And they set a higher price for the barrel of oil. They allocate how many barrels their members will produce. But all of a sudden, that's a oil shock to America. Because now we have to pay higher prices for that on, on those important sea goods. And hence, that's another kind, you can think of it that way, as a kind of another tax. Besides the corporate taxes, there's a tax to OPEC. So a new subsumed class payment arises to OPEC, okay? And so you can see, in terms of the right-hand side, this is a kind of crisis. These, there's others, but I'm going to just focus on these. The workers via their unions, the corporate taxes via the state, the higher prices for energy via OPEC, okay? And the final one. On the left-hand side of the equation, we have a, 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 a problem, which I mentioned to you, is that American industrial capitalists are losing surplus value to their competitors. So this is a loss of surplus value on the left-hand side via a struggle over super profits that we discussed in this course, and I gave you a couple of tables on that, okay? So here, American capitalists are losing what? They're losing the surplus in the TV industry to the competitive Japanese. And, and the United States, eventually, as this is, becomes very severe, is gonna lose, it's gonna, the TV industry is gonna disappear from the United States. That which was 
<coughs> at a very key important industry in the U.S. and the firms producing it disappears. And so the surplus value is lost to the more competitive Japanese. Automobile industry is coming under increased pressure. The big three, Ford, General Motors, um, and Chrysler, comes under increasing pressure by these competitive German, um, Italian, and um, uh, uh, Japanese uh, producers. They're losing surplus value via super profit to the competitors. Electronics industry in general. Okay, rubber industry, steel industry, it just goes on and on and on. So across the major industries in which there's a good deal of monopoly power, the capitalists are, are getting hit by competition on the left-hand side, whilst simultaneously they have to pay higher wages to the workers, sometimes and often in those same industries, higher corporate taxes to the state, and now they get hit with this oil shock from OPEC. So this is a, 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 a looming crisis which becomes um, an actual crisis as the 70s uh, uh, continue and uh, people talk about uh, uh, the end of American capitalism just like the British capitalism started to uh, decay um, after the 1870s they talk about now the, the decay of American capitalism <coughs> won't be able to compete with the uh, uh, super efficient uh, Japanese and you know, it, it's a, 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 a crisis. The crisis helps to, um, helps to produce a solution, which is that a, a man arrives upon the scene in the late 1970s, gets elected to office in 1981. It's President uh, Ronald Reagan. And President Ronald Reagan comes into office and I should, before that, President Reagan mounts a campaign in which he says American capitalism is being threatened by special interest groups. And he names them. The special interest groups are the unions, the strong unions, the state itself, and of course OPEC. Okay? These special interest groups, which are working in their own interests, are threatening the survival for America. And unless we do something about that, American capitalism will, um, will disappear. Okay? So he b mounts this kind of campaign. Um, he's very articulate. He's, a, you know, as you all know, is a former movie star, so he knows how to speak well. Very, very persuasive. He looks the part. And to make a long story short, this guy gets elected uh, president of the United, United States, and the, what he does do is deliver on his campaign promises. He goes to work on the right-hand side and the left-hand side. So I want to take that through because that's going to take us through the 1980s right up to the present. Okay. First, whether about, you know, these events happen. The air controllers go on strike in the United States. Okay, and the air controllers go on strike. That's a major industry, as you all know. And to make a very long story short, President Reagan goes after those workers. He replaces the uh, air controllers with federal um, employees in the airports. And to make a long story short, he breaks that, that strike. That's a very important strike. It's broken by, by uh, uh, the president. He's very clear in terms of what he's, what he's doing. The, air the, the strike would have been a, would still have been affected even if the uh, air even when the air controllers were, were replaced by federal uh, air controllers, if the trucks that deliver gasoline to uh, airplanes uh, did not do so. What happened was that the Teamsters um, still delivered their oil. They crossed the picket line in the airports and delivered their oil to the, uh, uh, the airports across the United States, which enabled those airplanes to uh, uh, take off. And you know, some people claim that, that there was some kind of deal that was struck between President Reagan and this particular union, and that may be or may not be. The, I don't know. But the point being is that there was a change circumstances during this, prison, this moment in time and President Reagan was certainly consistent on this, which is to go after these unions. And that set in chain 
a whole new environment in the United States in which, in a very short period of time, those unions which had been very strong, as I said to you, which had the heritage of FDR behind them and Harry Truman and so forth, became understood in the United States. A new culture kind of emerged in the United States and new laws were passed in Congress in the United States in which they became a special interest group working for their own interest against America. To make a long story short, this undermined the power of unions to charge a higher price for their labor power than the, the unit value. So this political, cultural, and indeed e economic uh, envi new environment that emerged in the United States helped to reduce, what's well, right here, reduce the price of labor power. Okay. That's not the only reason the price of labor power fell. But what I'm arguing here is the following, on the supply of labor power and the demand for labor power, price of labor power. This is what unions, that's, their, that's what their, power, their monopoly power allowed, to charge a higher price than the so-called competitive price. I think what President Reagan uh, started, and which Congress <coughs> adopted, was to remove this constraint, move that, remove that or erode that power on the part of unions, and then over the next several years, the price of labor power started to fall because unions no longer could do this, and more and more the market determined the price of labor power. And because of market changes, which I'm going to explain, the price of labor power in real terms started to fall. The real wage in the United States started to fall. And part of that fall was contributed with the erosion of workers. And that was a deliberate campaign promise of President Reagan. Secondly. Let's, I'm going to march through these, one, two, three, four. So the second one So this is being eroded. The second one was that corporate taxes were reduced. So the second one is, is another kind of campaign. Okay. And the campaign here was that the state is too large. The state is, um, is interfering with market incentives, is taking too much of, uh, of uh, uh, the profits of corporations to support all kinds of government expenditures. Okay. And the argument was that the, the federal government should reduce the corporate tax, which would allow corporations to invest more. And if they could invest more, that would raise the productivity of labor, and that would help to solve the left-hand side. That was a very strong argument okay, that was mounted at the time. So in fact, we had the beginning of a reduction of taxes, federal taxes, on corporations. But it's very difficult to get to that through Congress unless you're going to uh, cut uh, personal taxes on everybody else. And so what emerged is a, kind of, a new kind of culture in the United States in which the tax rates on corporations and the tax rates on individuals started to fall. Okay, and fall rather dramatically. It's probably the biggest tax cuts we've ever had in, in our history, first under President Reagan, then under um, uh, you know, uh, uh, President uh, uh, Bush number two. Okay? So we had dramatic cuts in taxes, which, tax rates, which are with us uh, today in the United States to solve this problem. And the idea here, the strategy was, if you lower the taxes on corporations, they could, what? They could increase especially the subsumed class payments for capital accumulation that we discussed previously in this course. So that's one component that would increase. You cut the PLP to workers, you cut the corporate taxes, and then you can boost this. Notice this, don't not forget this. This is the delta C. That's the investment in new means of production, which would raise the productivity. Remember, this is an increase in C over C plus V. That'll raise the productivity of workers that allow our industrial capitalists then to lower their average costs and compete effectively with the Germans, the Italians, the Japanese, the Brazilians, and so forth. Secondly, this will increase employment here times the number of hours. So even if the hours stay the same, you'll increase employment here because you'll be hiring more people, okay, more jobs. So the argument was a cut in taxes will enable higher productivity 
and more jobs. Okay. In other words, you put them together, it'll encourage growth. And that was part of the argument then and today by many in the Republican Party. So by reducing these subsumed class payments, you encourage capital accumulation and you get these two tremendous benefits. Okay. Next. <clears throat> the argument, the next kind of argument is that, uh, let me, you know, I should go back to this corporate taxes, I don't want to lose it. So the, the good side for the capitalists is, is this uh, is being reduced. <clears throat> There's another good side for the capitalists under President Reagan's uh, platform, which was we're going to reduce corporate taxes, but we're also going to increase uh, defense expenditures in order to, uh, let me just sum it up, in order to engage and defeat uh, the evil empire, which is that of the Soviet Union, which at that time was still, the Soviet Union was a communist country or claimed to be a communist country. So there was two parts to this. You reduce taxes, both corporate and personal taxes, and you raise government expenditures in terms of defense expenditures. So if, I just want to jump for a moment. For the state, it's got revenues it's got expenditures. These are revenues and these are expenditures from the state. You're reducing revenues by cutting the taxes, starting with President Reagan, both corporate and personal. You're raising expenditures on military. Well, it's not, you can see from the equation, you're going to get this. That is, the state's going to start running deficits, which it did. And so, it, this began a process of cutting taxes, left-hand side, raising or maintaining government expenditures, on, on uh, raising them for defense, maintaining them for as much as possible for everything else, and hence deficits were, were looming in the United States, were growing and growing to, to, this, to this day. And uh, that too will have consequences on the uh, economy because, you know, if you're running deficits, then the government is going to issue um, uh, bonds to help uh, uh, finance this deficit. Uh, increasing the supply of bonds is going to drop the price of bonds, or, or another way of saying the same thing, is going to raise the interest rate. And an increased interest rate is going to cause havoc on consumers and industrial capitalists. So it's another kind of contradiction. Okay, so to make a long story short, and I, I shall come back to it, solving this problem creates a crisis for the state. You can say in psychological terms that the problem for industrial capitalists has been displaced onto the state in terms of state deficits. Let me take the, now the third one. Third one is also very interesting. Okay, and the third one argues the following. Okay, again, it's very complicated. I just want to summarize this. President Reagan and the Republicans and many economists argued at the time what we have to do is deregulate markets. Remember where I started? It's a regulated capitalism, and so the shift was to a more deregulated capitalism. We've got to get the state out of the business of trying to regulate various kinds of, of markets. One of the markets that was regulated at the time was the oil and gas uh, market in the United States, because we are a major producer of oil and gas. We still import a lot, but we're still a major producer. But the price of gas and oil was uh, more or less fixed by the, by the state. We set a price um, uh, floor higher than the equilibrium price, and we wouldn't allow that price to, to uh, 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 I'm sorry, we, we set a price uh, uh, ceiling in the United States, and we didn't allow the price, uh, the market price to rise above that. Meanwhile, because of OPEC, world prices were rising, but they were he being held uh, steady in the United States, and that's an impossible situation. So the argument was, starting with this industry, but then airlines and a variety of other industries besides oil and gas, get rid of these uh, uh, price regulations, you know, for oil and gas, if I might just very simply do that one, um, the price of, of oil and gas of energy in the United States, we were over here. So the government was setting this particular uh, price, uh, you know, ceiling and not allowing the prices to rise above that, okay? And 
creating thereby an excess demand, whereas world prices were rising. So the argument was, get rid of this. Let the, let the world prices, uh, this is the new demand, let the world price rise. So in that, that's what happened in the airline industry, the oil and gas, and a variety of other industries across the United States, which had, which had been regulated. So let the prices of these things rise. And then the argument there was, which comes from neoclassical economic theory, which in a sense was elected to office with President Reagan. So the Keynesian theory, which had been hegemonic, started to erode the neoclassical theory, the theory of markets, started to become hegemonic. And there the argument has always been that if you allow the prices to rise in the short run, then hopefully that will stimulate two things. It'll stimulate existing firms to expand their supply and new firms to enter the industry with a, because of the higher potential profits that they can earn or profit rate that they can earn. And, and that will then shift the supply curve to the right for those two reasons. And the price will fall as the short run turns into the intermediate and the long run. And in fact, that's what happened, <laughs> I think, in the oil industry. By getting rid of the regulation, allowing the price in the United States to rise, that gave an incentive to U.S. firms to uh, discover new oil fields in you know, uh, Alaska and the Gulf of Mexico, uh, to redrill in old field, older fields, and, and the, the, the supply probably, the supply curve did become uh, more elastic in the long run, um, so there was an, a, a good deal of increased supply of oil, and that put a tremendous pressure on OPEC. So in real terms, the price of oil fell. These, this, um, if I can use a strong term, this attack, this war on these special inter interest groups in these different ways, likely enabled the, the uh, industrial capitalists to redistribute more of their surplus from what they have been giving to workers, what they have been giving to the state and corporate taxes, what they have been given to OPEC, to now increase capital accumulation, to spend more in research and development for new kinds of products, Okay, which would embody more surplus value. They had more also for uh, mergers. They could buy one, buy each other up and become larger and with the idea that they would be able to increase their productivity um, in so doing. And the productivity of labor did rise in the United States. I think that's an argument that could easily be sustained. It's, it, new technologies that were developed, that's the computer revolution. To make a long story short, the United States um, stopped losing as much super profit as it did before as there was a recovery in the automobile industry, um, recovery in the steel industry, and new industries arose. Why? Because in part, the United States was a, a, a place in which the price of labor power in real terms had fallen Okay, so if, if corporate taxes had fallen, it became a favorable place to produce precisely because of this attack. So let me give you an example of this over here. One of the, remember if you go, we go back, we did average cost was very important. If you remember this average cost was C plus V divided by UV. One of the variables that became um, very important in, in terms of discussions in the United States was something called unit labor costs, which was the price of uh, labor power divided by the productivity of labor in our terms. So you take the price of labor power, and the argument was that this was too high in the United States in the 19, after World War II, okay? That the price of labor power was high and the productivity was low. The reason for the high numerator was precisely the workers having this, these strong unions and able to get a price higher than value. The reason for a low denominator, because the capitalists didn't have the wherewithal to accumulate new machines, embody new technology, and hence the productivity was too, too low. The automobile companies had to pay higher prices to the UAW workers because of the strong union there, 
and the productivity of those automobile workers wa was was too low, okay, um, because the the, the 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 capitalist in the automobile industry didn't have sufficient left to invest in new kinds of plant and equipment because they were being hammered by these three demands um, added to their other subsumed class payments. So the idea was you could reduce unit labor costs in the United States by getting rid of the strong unions in the numerator and freeing up more of the, the uh, 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 surplus to be distributed to capital accumulation, embodying, embodying new technology, that's robots, to increase this while simultaneously you decrease this, that would bring down unit labor costs to produce a car in the United States, and that might allow the United States to then become competitive and stop losing super profits to its competitors. To make a long story short, the United States would become a location in which the, the Japanese would start producing um, the Honda um, Accord, and perhaps even some of those Accords could be produced in the U.S. and shipped to Japan because the unit labor costs um, had been driven down in, in the United States. I want to uh, uh, continue this story and finish up uh, uh, next time about what happened to American capitalism by telling you about a number of consequences um, on U.S. capitalism, and I shall stop there.